I've got um, a fairly ambitious um, schedule for us today, and I'm going to do my best to work our way through it. I just found out that I have 90 minutes instead of 75, so this is fabulous, and I think we should um, do a good job of getting through the material. Uh, the sort of overview of what I'm going to talk about today um, is really driven by a lot of what we've been talking about already. I'm going to do a very brief introduction into what it is we mean when we say risk assessment, because much like evidence-based practice, it's a very sexy term. We're all told we have to do it without really knowing exactly what that means, and this term has sort of taken on different genera uh, generations of um, definitions over time, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk very briefly about the justice context. Um, you all probably know this as well or better than I do, um, but just to reiterate some of the points that David and some of the other speakers today have talked about already in terms of why it is we need to do a good job of risk assessment in the justice context. I'm going to go through the historical context. I'm going to try to tell you why there's been so much work and focus and development in the area of risk assessment. And there's going to be a bit of a crosswalk here between the world of risk assessment for offending, which is what we're going to be talking about primarily, but also risk, offend, uh, risk assessment for violence. And those two worlds um, have sort of infiltrated each other, um, but are very different things. I'm going to talk. Um, sort of for the rest of the presentation um, about the contemporary context in terms of what we know about risk assessment for recidivism in the US at present day. And we're going to talk about um, some of the findings of this report, this monograph that David mentioned that myself and Dr. Jay Singh worked on for the last six months, looking at what people are using in the United States and how well they are actually working in practice. Going to then talk about this notion of taking risk assessment from the research world, which is where I spend most of the time, and then going into the real world context of implementation and how do we actually use this? Because it's one, say, uh, one thing to say that I've taken on a validated instrument, it's been shown in research studies to work, and now we're using it. Well, does it actually work for you guys? Is it actually working the way it's supposed to in your setting? So first, by way of introduction, we're going to get sort of back to basics here. I'm going to start off with a definition. Risk assessment is the process of evaluating and managing the likelihood of future offending. And this notion of and managing seems to go without saying, and yet it doesn't actually happen a lot of the time. Most of us stop at this process of evaluating. And I'm going to talk a little bit later today about why this is actually a really important distinction. I also wanted to mention this notion of likelihood. This is important in the justice context specifically for a lot of reasons. First of all, it means we don't completely understand it. It means that it's a likelihood. It's an estimate. It is our best educated guess. But it doesn't mean that we know the correct answer. And this is something I deal with a lot. I go into a lot of different agencies, and I'm working with frontline staff who don't want to actually write down their risk assessments in case they're wrong. Well, the whole point of doing a risk assessment is to have the best evidence put together, but it doesn't mean that we can predict everything. The other thing that this notion of likelihood indicates is that these probabilities can and do change over time. We um, have to understand that we as humans and the offenders themselves can change. Things change. Their environments change. And this notion of estimating risk is not a static thing. It's not something we do and then we're done. So this idea of risk assessment necessarily involves consideration of the possibility of change. And then finally, mentioned this already, but we have to consider about the characteristics of the individual, but also where they're going to be, what's going on in their lives. Where is it that we hope we return them to? One of the things that um, I also sort of emphasize when I'm doing work with um, clinicians particularly is that we have to think about the general population, those people out there in the community as our comparison sample and not simply say, well, he's not nearly as bad as this other guy we're working with. So the notion is that if we're going to be able to return these folks to the community, well, we have to think of the community as our comparison sample. A few very brief comments that we're going to come back to later as well. 
This idea of risk assessment, it's not just one thing. If I say I do a risk assessment and you say you do a risk assessment, it doesn't mean that we're doing the same thing. They can be unstructured, meaning that they're not using a specific tool. Doesn't mean that they haven't completed a structured interview, just that the risk assessment itself wasn't guided by a specific tool. Or they can be structured, and we're gonna to return to these distinctions again, but this notion of being structured, there's two different types. There's the very mechanical actuarial approach, and this is the same thing that um, our life insurance agents do for us when we're trying to get our policies renewed. Okay, how old are you? History of X, Y, and Z. And then we return to this, and this ends up leading us to a probability or a likelihood of recidivism. The other approach is structured, but with a bit of wiggle room. Um, it allows for um, what has been termed in many cases a clinical override or a professional judgment. And this is where we're actually allowed to bring back in to the picture some of our expertise, some of the, well, I know this guy and I've been working with him for a long time and that's not really the situation or the picture. So this notion of clinical override doesn't negate the existence of structure, but it, at the end of the day, allows us to use some of that important experience that we've gained over time. So those are some of the basics. So that's when I say risk assessment, this is what we're talking about. I think what's also really important about it is to recognize that this is a big picture process. Like I said, it's not fi simply filling out a questionnaire and then putting it on a file, though that is very frequently what happens. So here we first have to identify areas of risk and need, and I'm gonna argue later also strength. We have to analyze them and figure out what that means in terms of um, probability or estimates of um, future offending. Now, this is where things usually start to fall apart. We have to actually do something with that information. And so for me, in my definition of risk assessment, there's necessarily a component where we're talking about case planning. All right, we identified these risks and needs. We identified that this person is at moderate or high risk of recidivism. Well, what are we gonna do about that? Now that we have a plan in place and we've done a great job, it's a very comprehensive plan, it could really work. Well, we have to look at whether it is working. So we have to monitor these individuals over time. And then finally, we have to be sort of brave enough to say, hey, it's not working. What is it that we're doing that isn't working? Or what is it that's going on with this individual that means it's not working? And how do we have to revisit and revise our case plan? At that point, we start this whole process all over again. So this notion of risk assessment is not simply something that's done at intake and then we never do one again. This is something that has to happen throughout um, the offenders stay within the correctional system and even after into the community. The last piece that is going to um, come back to us throughout the day is also we have to actually tell somebody about it. <laughs> it's not enough that I've done a really good risk assessment. I have a really great case plan. Um, I come up with a monitoring and evaluation plan. I have to tell people about it. And one of the things that we find so often when we're working in real world implementations is that this communication piece is actually where things can really go wrong. And so I um, get called into a lot of situations where they're using risk assessment tools and um, doing really great, really accurate and reliable risk assessments and there's been a critical incident. And what we find time and time again is that the critical incident, the risk of it, the likelihood, the entire cycle of how this was going to happen is very well documented and nobody knew about it. And so there's been a failure to communicate what the findings of their risk assessment were. And I appreciate the constraints within which you work and I don't want to say that it's as easy as picking up a phone because I know that there's a lot of time and energy put into a lot of different things. But when we're gonna do a good job of implementing a risk assessment, we also have to come up with communication protocols. And that is not taught anywhere in any manual. That's not gonna be written in um, the LSI's manual about how you then tell somebody about it, but you have to figure out how you're gonna do it and how you're gonna do it in your agency. So some important distinctions in terms of um, what sort of comprises a risk assessment. 
David's already mentioned a few of these. We actually touched on some of these in the break set, breakout sessions as well. But I'm going to um, go into a little bit more detail about some of these issues. And it's not just for the sake of um, you know, spending some time up here talking about some academic terms. It's because they actually matter. We've talked a lot about this notion of static and dynamic factors. Both are important from a prediction point of view. We have good research now to say that both static and dynamic risk factors contribute to the prediction of outcome. What I wanted to point out here is that there's a couple of different types of static and dynamic factors. When we talk about static factors, we can have those things that don't change because we can't change them like age. We can have historical information like um, the number of prior offenses. So we have historical versus static. The other sort of more important distinction perhaps for um, intervention and case planning purposes, however, is this difference between stable and acute dynamic factors. And so there are some things that change very quickly. Um, anybody working on the front line, mood. Your mood can change like that. Anything, anybody with teenagers knows that their mood can change like that. But when we're talking about things that are more entrenched behaviors, they can change. They just might take a bit of a longer time. And so one of the things we need to consider in our monitoring protocols and in how we're going to evaluate um, progress is to recognize that some things will change very quickly. So we should expect to see a change in, let's say, weeks or months. Other things might take months to years. And so just to be cognizant of that, that we're going to be looking at different time frames for measurement when we're talking about reviewing these case plans. We haven't um, talked yet about this, but I just wanted to mention it um, just for your knowledge. There is also this um, distinction that we make in the risk assessment world between distal and proximal factors. Distal being those that happened way long ago. That's the technical definition. <laughs> and proximal being those things that happened very recently. And what we know is that these have differential importance in terms of the timing of outcomes. And so distal factors are actually um, very robust predictors of long-term outcomes. So what is going to um, happen with this offender in the next 5, 10, or 15 years? And that's an important question. But we also have to figure out what we're going to do with that offender in the next weeks, months, or a few years. And we find that the proximal factors, those things that happen very recently in their lives, are actually the more robust predictors of those shorter term time frames. So again, when we're getting into the risk planning and case management process, these are issues that seem sort of trivial from a big picture, but that actually are incredibly relevant. We talked already about this difference between a risk factor versus something that is criminogenic. So an obvious one we've been talking a lot about today is mental illness. And people question, why is it not part of the central eight? Well, mental illness is a great example of a factor that you can look at as being a risk factor or a criminogenic need based on that offender. For some offenders, their mental illness is a very important criminogenic need. It's tied directly to their criminal behavior. Other offenders, it is not a criminogenic need, though it is certainly a treatment need. And so there's a need to look on a very individual basis when we're doing risk assessment. What we have to actually address and sort of manage in a case plan later on is going to depend on that given an offender. This distinction has really earned me quite the reputation as a bleeding heart and a liberal Canadian. Um, and I want to talk for a minute about this difference um, between a risk and a protective factor. And there's a lot of debate in the field, and so I'm going to let you um, sort of bear with me for a few minutes and hopefully convince you that protective factors, even in this population that we're working with, is actually really important. So first, a definition. A protective factor is any characteristic that reduces the risk of offending. Clear everything it up? <laughs> Clear as mud, right? So um, what I want to make the point here, though, is that this is not just the absence of a risk factor. And in fact, this is a question I get no matter what setting I am going to. Um, when I was giving my job talk at the University of South Florida five years ago, they asked me this as well. Well, you know, what is a risk factor? 
And if I had that answer, I would certainly be making a lot more money. Um, but what I'm going to tell you here is that this notion of being more than the absence of a risk factor, I think, is why we've gotten it wrong so far. I think this is why that the research hasn't caught up to where it should be, because we're measuring them just as the opposite or the absence of a risk factor. I'm going to give you two examples I have stolen shamelessly. And this is going to start my um, sort of trajectory of stealing shamelessly from all of my colleagues. So this first one I take from Dr. Tanya Nichols, who I worked with for many years in Vancouver, Canada. She's got a teenage daughter. And um, her teenage daughter is currently living at home and um, very popular, pretty girl, um, dates a lot of guys. And Tanya often says during um, trainings that we do together, I am not just looking for that boy who rings the doorbell to be not a psychopath. <laughs> right? But that's what we're saying when we're saying that a risk factor or a protective factor is just the opposite of a risk factor. Well, then it's just the absence of psychopathy. Well, no, what we're looking for are actually positive qualities in this individual. I'd like him to be caring and nurturing. I'd like him to have a job. I'd like him to have a car so that um, you know, somebody can drive her daughter around. I'd like him to be good looking. You know, these are actually positive characteristics and qualities of an individual that might not be there if we only have an absence of psychopathy. The second example I'm going to give is very relevant to the populations we work with. Um, and it's about child abuse. So going along the same you know, line of thought, the absence of child abuse is not a protective factor. There's an absence of a risk factor, but it doesn't mean that that offender had a warm, loving relationship with his or her parents. It doesn't mean that they had that attached bond with a caregiver growing up that we know to be protective. And so when we're talking about protective factors, and I'm going to get off my soapbox in a moment, but when we're working in this world with offenders, it's not just about saying, well, they don't have psychopathy or they don't have a history of violence. So these are four of my reasons that if you pick up any one of my articles on risk assessment, you'll find them. They'll be there. Um, and that I reiterate every time I talk about protective factors. First of all, I think it's the only way we're going to have a balanced view of the offender. If we are truly in this to rehabilitate, this is going to be core to what we do. I also teach Introduction to Psychology, so would everybody for a moment look at the screen and tell me what you see. <laughs> so here the idea is that we can see very different things if we pay attention to very different um, pieces of this picture. If we look at the black, we see two faces. If we look at the white, we see a vase or a vase, depending what country I'm talking in. <laughs> So my point being that if we're only attending to risk factors, well, we're only going to have that view of the offender. And we're not going to recognize some of the actual positive characteristics or strengths that they bring to the table, and that I think from a therapeutic point of view are the cornerstone to rehabilitation. The second thing I want to make the argument is that we are now having emerging evidence, um, I can name a, a few studies for those of you who are interested, that they actually add to the predictive validity of these instruments. And that's important from a pure evidence-based um, practice point of view. And I really think that part of the reason why we weren't cracking that sort of 75 to 80 percent prediction rate with the existing tools is that we're missing some important pieces of the puzzle. These are characteristics and factors that reduce the likelihood of an outcome, or buffer, or mitigate, or whatever language you want to use. And so these are important pieces of predicting what's going to happen. Um, I mentioned this already in terms of the balanced view, but it also is incredibly important to therapeutic alliance. And there is an entire treatment literature that tells us that this is one of the most important keys to effective treatment. And again, if we're talking about the positive characteristics, albeit maybe few that exist in this individual, we're at a much better place to actually build a therapeutic alliance and create the possibility of rehabilitation. Finally, um, I think there's a professional mandate. In fact, most of the professions we come from have a mandate that we're supposed to look at not only 
the negative traits of the individuals we work with, but also the positive traits. Um, as a psychologist, it's very clear in the APA guidelines that I'm supposed to look at my client's strengths as well as their um, psychopathology. There's a whole movement in positive psychology. We're just catching up to um, the social work fields in particular to look at positive and strength-based care. And this is a quote for me that just really drives home what we're talking about here. Treatment is not just fixing what is broken, it is nurturing what is best. And now this is a new idea for us working in corrections, but I think this is something that we really need to move toward and that more and more agencies are starting to talk about. The other thing I wanted to mention before we get into you know, what risk assessment actually is, is that recidivism is not one behavior. So these instruments are designed to predict offending or recidivism, and what that actually means, really who knows. So it could mean um, new offenses, or it could be violations, and these distinctions are actually really important. They're important from a pure um, predictive validity point of view. They're also important because it's gonna change what it is we're trying to do from a risk management point of view. There's violent versus nonviolent offenses, and those risk factors look very different. Those cycles that lead up to those things might be very different. Sexual versus non-sexual violence. So if I just say that I have a tool that's really good at predicting recidivism, it could be any one of these things. So there's a need for specificity when we're using language around risk. I'm gonna give away the um, end of my presentation. What we found going through all the literature is what pretty much everybody else has ever found, that these tools work best at predicting what they're supposed to predict. So if you're using a tool that was designed to predict sexual violence, well then it's probably gonna be better at predicting sexual violence than general offending. Makes sense. So be very careful when you're selecting a tool that you're actually picking a tool that is designed to predict your outcome of interest. If you're using a um, substance use screen, that is not designed pre to predict recidivism. It is certainly associated with it, but it is not a risk assessment tool. So very briefly, going to touch on you know, why the heck you guys need to care about this. Um, and it's purely about criminal justice um, policy and approaches. And I um, just want to uh, mention that a lot of this is coming from the work of Andrews and Bonta, two very bright Canadians, I might add. <laughs> I try to um, sort of temper my Canadian accent as much as I can, but it'll come through, I'm sure. So I think the point of all of this is that the criminal justice system has operated for most of sort of our generation of work around get tough policies. And well, lo and behold, they don't work. And um, if you go to the psychology literature, which is where Andrews and Bonta came from when they were doing this work, is, well, we know absolutely why they don't work. They don't meet the criteria for effective punishment. In fact, if anyone has kids or a pet that they've tried to tra uh, train, you all are very familiar with this. In fact, my dog pees on the carpet because punishment doesn't work. So here, um, the criteria for effective punishment are just simply impossible to pull off in the criminal justice setting. So first of all, maximum in intensity of punishment, well that's not going to happen because we have all sorts of rules about where offenders can go and it not, it's not necessarily tied into what they do. Um, the um, consistent application, well that is not going to be occurring across all of these settings as well and the blocking of escape and alternative reinforcements. And that's the hardest one, because they're gonna have all sorts of reinforcements from other sources for the antisocial behavior, regardless of what we're doing with the um, sort of treatment and intervention. And so about 50 years of psychology research has said that this doesn't work, and now I think in the criminal justice world, we're starting to pick up and say, yeah, maybe those psychologists were right. <laughs> Just on this one issue. <laughs> So in um, recent years, there's been a lot of shifting towards rehabilitation, and I think that's why we're all here today. Well, how are we going to be rehabilitating these individuals if we're not going to be punishing them as the primary mode of intervention? 
And uh, I'm going to let you all fill in the blanks here. Um, treatment effectiveness occurs with adherence to the risk principle, the needs principle, and the responsivity principle. And I'm not going to spend any more time going into what these are. I think you guys have been drilled home time and time again um, throughout this conference, and I'm sure every other sort of training you've had to attend. Um, but what I wanted to point out here, that it's not enough to pay lip service to doing a strength-based approach or doing an approach based on R&R or shifting our attention to rehabilitation. Well, how are you going to do that if you don't know what the risks, needs, and responsivity issues are with this given offender? And the only way we're going to do that is if you do a very good risk assessment of that individual offender. I can tell you what your population looks like on a whole. We can look at reports, we can look at data, and we can say that on average, these are the issues that we need to deal with our offender, with our offender populations. But that doesn't tell me anything about this one person sitting in front of me. So some of this is lead up to um, what's happened with risk assessment. And um, I usually call this my 30 years and 30 seconds. Um, but I will try to do my best to keep this um, at a minimum so that we can talk a little bit more about uh, what to do with it now and how you guys are going to move forward. The first generation, um, which was labeled so by John Monahan, um, was the generation of unstructured professional judgment. And this is where a professional was maybe doing interviews, going in, and coming up with their assessment of what the individual um, risk for future offending was. Some advantages about this approach, this approach which to this day is the most prominent approach to risk assessment, whether it's offending or violence. First of all, it's incredibly convenient and flexible. I can certainly go into a jail and do this, no problem. I can go into any setting, anywhere. I don't require anything to come with me. It's inexpensive. I don't have to pay for forms. Nobody's charging me copyright issues. I don't have to order any additional pieces of paper to do another assessment. It's widely accepted, like I said, courts expect this, judges expect this. This is something that we um, see regularly. People don't question it, although I think that's changing. Um, the thing that for me today is gonna be the one we keep touching on is that it, it is actually able to inform treatment and management because naturally the people who are doing these um, assessments are going to turn to issues like mood and um, insight and issues or mental illness and substance use. These are things that we can actually treat and do something about. These are those dynamic factors that we're trained when we go into the mental health practice to do work around or in the behavioral health world. Well, unfortunately, despite all these advantages, there's a whole lot of disadvantages as well. Um, the one that I want to really focus on here is that they're no better at chance, um, at prediction of recidivism than chance. And this, well, this is a very important issue. This is a problem. Um, what's the point of doing a whole risk assessment if at the end of the day it's actually no better than just flipping a coin? And very famously, Ennis and Litwack in the 1970s wrote a monograph which was called Flipping Coins in the Courtroom, basically saying that mental health professionals, psychiatrists specifically, had no business doing this work. And so that led to entire um, 20 years of research, really, saying, we've got to get better at doing this. How are we going to get better at doing this? How are we going to remove our personal biases? How are we going to make these um, assessments more consistent over time? How are we going to increase our transparency? Well, that led to what's been called the second generation. And this has come about after years and years, 20 plus years of research on those things that increase the likelihood of adverse outcomes. And there's a real focus on static factors. So these are empirically based, typically very mechanical. Um, these are things um, that we take a set of risk factors, we basically say yes or no, and then we come up with a total score. That total score then goes to an actuarial table, which indicates a probability of offending. So some things about this approach. It's very transparent. If I fill out this assessment and you fill it out, we're looking at the same, let's say, 10 factors. 
It's um, actually relatively easy to do. They're things that are available typically on file. These are the very big, robust things. History of violence, number of prior criminal offenses, age of first offense, sex. Um, these are things that we can look up with no problem. We can usually do this kind of risk assessment five or 10 minutes, max. We don't even have to talk to the offender. Um, they're easy. I don't need to get a lot of training around this. I can usually just pick up a tool and say yes or no. The important thing here is that they do have very good accuracy. And so here we jumped up the accuracy rate from chance. And so we were moving in the right direction. We're increasing our ability to actually predict these adverse outcomes that we're charged with preventing. Well, of course, there are disadvantages. One of the ones that's interesting um, about this is that they were largely atheoretical. And not to say that these were um, uh, by design atheoretical, but they were data driven. So they were um, developed taking entire databases of offenders, compiling all sorts of statistics about their different characteristics, and then looking at which of those characteristics rose to the top as being the most robust statistical predictors of outcome. The, the classic example we give around this is that shoe size actually emerged as a very robust predictor. I'm not making it up. <laughs> There's an actual an instrument out there that has shoe size. Well, what are we going to do? Go around with a foot measure that we take from Foot Locker and measure each offender's shoe size, and then that's how we're going to decide who gets released? Well, shoe size is related to body size and height, which is in turn related to whether or not they inflict injury during their offending. And so that's what shoe size is about. There's no reason that somebody with um, a given shoe size in turn must be an offender. The other thing that I want to talk about for a minute is that they don't allow for change over time because these are things that are static that forevermore this individual will be at, at least this level of recidiv uh, likelihood of recidivism. So if they're 75% likely to recidivate over the next 15 years today, 10 years from now, they're still going to be at 75% likelihood of recidivating over the next 15 years. And this is a problem. If our shift is towards rehabilitation, and we're not allowing for change in the instruments that we're using, so the classic example that gets cited all the time is the broken leg dilemma. And so this notion that with physical incapacitation, the offender's likelihood of offending might actually change. So if they break their leg, they might be less likely to rob a store. Um, more actually frequent and common occurrences are things like changes of setting. If so, if we put somebody into a highly secure setting, that's going to affect their ability to reoffend. But that static risk tool would still say they were at the same level of risk. Um, interpersonal relationships. In fact, romance and love is a very important predictor of desistance, so movement away from recidivism. Employment, people have jobs. And then for us here, if we're going to talk about feeding risk assessment into intervention, well, the idea there is that we're actually going to affect change, right? We're trying to do treatment with these individuals to reduce their likelihood of offending, and yet we're using instruments that don't allow for that. So we're going to return um, to this issue uh, again um, a little later. But there's also limited integration of intervention, because what the heck am I going to do about the fact that this guy has a size 13 shoe? Am I going to bind his feet? Is that going to reduce his likelihood of offending? Am I going to take this offender who's 18 today and I'm going to wait until he's 45 because that's when his risk goes down? Well, I'd like to be a little bit more proactive in my intervention approach, but these tools don't allow us to do that. So if we're thinking about that cycle, that process I showed you, we've sort of gotten stuck after step two. One last limitation of these approaches is this notion that the decisions are based on group norms. And be forewarned, I'm going to make you do a calculation in just a moment. And obviously, David and I have attended similar trainings in the past, because there might be three examples that we all use when we're talking about risk assessment, and here it goes. <laughs> 
So we have a group of 100 offenders and 50 recidivate within five years. Okay, so here we have a 50% recidivism rate. Does this mean that every member of this group of 100, and there's 100 I counted, had a 50% likelihood of recidivism? Or does that mean that half had a 100% likelihood and the other half had a 0% chance? And bear with me on this one because this is when my undergrads head spin. Or that 20 had a 100% chance, 20 had a 75% chance, 20 had a 50% chance, 20 had a 25% chance, and 20 had a 0% chance. We don't know. My point here is not about statistics. It's not about calculations. My point is that we don't know where this one offender falls within that group. So they had a 50% likelihood, great. What does that mean in terms of what I'm supposed to do with this one person in front of me? So um, people like myself have gotten on board with saying, well, maybe it's not just about mechanical approaches. Maybe it's not just about those historical and static factors. And so that led to the development of the third generation where we started talking about dynamic factors and criminogenic needs. So here we're talking about empirically based tools based on what we know in the literature as well as in specific research studies. And they're including a much wider variety of factors now. And this is where we started to really see the infiltration of the r, &R model into the risk assessment world. Some advantages here is that they're still transparent. We're all assessing the same factors. They now can be sensitive to change over time. And I say can be because you have to do it more than once to be able to detect change. So that's both a strength of this approach, but also potentially a disadvantage because it means you have to repeat the assessment process. These also have very good reliability and accuracy. And in fact, we're starting to see evidence that the addition of these dynamic factors increase our predictive validity even more. It's nice now that they're theoretically sound. So we're not talking about things like shoe size. And finally, um, there's a bit more of an identification of treatment targets. If these things are dynamic, well, that means that I could affect change in them or that somehow we could make um, a reduction in recidivism risk. Some disadvantages here is, like I said earlier, well, to detect the change, you have to do it again. You can't just assess at intake and use that to detect change. So as a result, they also have a potentially shorter shelf life. So here you're going to have to repeat it. We're saying that these are dynamic. We're saying that thus these can change. And therefore, you have to see whether or not these things have changed. As a result, they can also be more time consuming. Assessing somebody's anger level is more difficult than asking them how old they are. Um, we still see a lot of decision making based on group norms. Um, and again, there's limited integration of intervention. We are pointing them towards intervention targets, but we're not actually telling you what to do. All right, I saw elevated risk in this area, now what? So here, if we're going along my process, we have made it to step three, and I've graded out that, that word just because we haven't quite finished. So we've seen what's finally been called the fourth generation of tool. And here is when we're actually integrating case planning and intervention. And so now a lot of the tools that are coming out in the last five years or so are really looking at also guiding what people do with the risk assessment once it's been completed. There's um, identification of treatment targets, but also treatment modalities, thinking about that responsivity principle. Um, and then assessment of progress over time. So these are something that go with the offender and are repeated over time throughout their participation in the correctional system and into the community. All of these advantages now that we've been seeing with the third generation are still there. Um, and we also see also a lot more um, allowance for clinical judgment or professional judgment. So some of those clinical overrides like I talked about earlier. So here, we're completing the cycle with the fourth generation tool.
And I've got to say, this is brand new stuff. This is so brand new that there's very limited use and um, research base around it. Some disadvantages, so I want to just emphasize then um, again here that there really is a smaller research base, not to say that they don't work. The research that does exist is very promising, but it's just so new that there isn't good long-term follow-up data. And so I'm very hopeful and um, encouraging all of you who are using these sorts of fourth-generation approaches to actually evaluate whether they're working in your institutions. So that's a history of everything you ever could possibly want and more of risk assessment. And we're going to talk now about what people are actually doing. So um, my postdoctoral student at the University of South Florida, Jay Singh, and I um, were asked by uh, Dr. Osher and um, David to put together a report and talk about um, what's actually being used out there, what are people actually using, and are they actually working? So um, as you all know, I'm sure there's pressure on your agencies and um, there's lots of mandates to use um, risk assessment um, tools in correctional settings because we know these unstructured approaches simply are inadequate. We identified in the US more than 60 different risk assessment tools currently being used in practice. And if we looked at the broader picture of just how many tools are out there, we're in the hundreds. They varied in terms of their intended population. Some were for parolees, some were for inmates, some were for certain subpopulations, female offenders, for example. Some are defined, uh, designed for certain outcomes. They differ in terms of content, too. So one of the things we looked at is how many of the instruments were tapping into the, all of those different central eight um, risk factors, whether or not there were protective factors also differed a lot. They differed in approach. Some were mechanical, some were um, more comprehensive, uh, included multiple approaches. Some used that sort of structured professional judgment approach. They also differed widely in terms of the length and time required. And then another very real world sustainability issue is they also differ in how expensive they are. Some of these are free. Some of these actually cost a lot of money. And so I think that's a very important concrete, if you're going to ask me later on today, which tool do I use, ask yourself this question and be realistic about it. So here's just a list, and I don't expect you to know all of these or to write this all down, and my slides will be available, so don't feel like you have pressure to scribble all these down. But here are the um, sort of 12 top um, instruments or families of instruments that sort of rose in terms of most frequently used and had most of the US research behind it. Not to say that the evidence was all good, so hold on for a second. Um, but these were the tools that are currently being used in practice. One thing I wanted to point out is that surveys of professionals in um, different settings, whenever they get asked about risk assessment tools, they start to talk about other instruments they use as well. And so I wanted to very briefly touch on these before um, we move on into the, the findings of our um, research. So one thing that frequently comes up is that individuals are using violence risk assessment tools to predict general offending. And I think this is a positive in certain ways in that there's a lot of overlap, um, but the research base isn't there. So we don't know if, in fact, these tools that are designed to predict violence are also good predictors of general offending. Um, lots of people using personality assessment inventories, um, things like the uh, MMPI, things like the psychopathy checklist, things like the PAI. Um, and these are all designed to assess personality characteristics. And if you recall to the list that David showed us earlier today, that is really just one area of the central eight. So I think it's a great thing to do to look at personality characteristics of the offenders in terms of informing treatment, but it's really just one of the risk factors we need to attend to. We also see some agencies using criminal thinking questionnaires. And so these are instruments that are designed to assess thought patterns and attitudes associated specifically with criminal behavior. 
But again, this is just one risk factor. And so you're doing a whole assessment. You can't call it a risk assessment. You can only call it an assessment of criminal thinking. Though it is true, we do see associations with criminal behavior. The other thing I wanted to point out here is that there's a whole body of research in um, psychology that shows us that our attitudes are actually very poor predictors of our behaviors. And so, sure, they do increase the likelihood, but just because I believe something does not necessarily mean I do it. So, for example, I think it's incredibly important that people engage in physical activity. I myself, not so much. <laughs> So I wanted to very quickly summarize some of the, the stuff that we found. And um, there will not be statistics or numbers here. These are just broad strokes issues that I'm more than happy to talk about in more detail later. So one of the things that was actually quite shocking to us is that there are surprisingly few evaluations conducted in the US. And so people um, often ask me about the LSI, so the level of service inventory, huge research base actually not that many studies conducted in US samples. So we found for most of these instruments on the previous page, so most of these instruments only had about one or two evaluation studies conducted in the US. The other thing I wanted to mention here that we're going to come back to is that most of these studies were constructed or conducted by these authors of the instruments. Well, and that makes complete sense. And we're going to come back to this issue later, um, but there's sort of important considerations to um, have a lens or have in the back of your mind when you're looking at this research. And it's not to say that my colleagues and I are biasing or fudging our results to, making, to make our own instruments look good. What it means instead is that these are the ideal circumstances under which to test an instrument. Because here you have the person who designed it come in and train you and then evaluate the instrument knowing um, everything that they know about how it's supposed to work. And so it's not to say that it's biasing the results on purpose or that we're systematically trying to get you guys to buy one of our instruments, but rather we're giving the hands-on assistance and sort of technical assistance that might not be available to you if you were going to implement this same tool in your own agency. We had even fewer evaluations of inter-rater reliability, and this is a critical concern. We, um, I understand completely why. So it's very unrealistic or difficult in the real world, for example, to get two correctional officers or two probation officers to assess the same guy using the same instrument. That is not time efficient or cost effective. However, from a research point of view, that sort of data is key because we need to know that if I fill out this risk assessment using this tool on this guy, that when you do it, you're gonna get the same answer. And so this is something um, that we really um, were quite shocked about. And um, I really want to sort of leave as a take home message for you all. There are ways to do this in program evaluation. And it's something that I'm more than happy to talk about later. Um, one other thing that we see consistently across the risk assessment fields is that those risk bins, so those categories of low, moderate, or high, are much better predictors of outcome than the use of the total scores. And I mentioned this for two reasons. First, because most people actually default to using the total scores, when in fact the research tells us that it's the categorizations that perform better. The second reason I say this is because many agencies adapt those bins according to what they've decided in their agency. So they change the cutoff scores. And while without the research or the um, evaluation to make sure that that is OK and that that works, you're actually not using the instrument you're saying you're using. So this is the reason my phone rings. You know, um, you know as the state of California, we want to know which um, instrument we should implement. And there's my very official answer that I get paid the big bucks for. <laughs> So it depends, what is it that you want to do? What is the population you're working in? No one instrument performed best across all different settings. There's evidence of some superiority of different instruments as a function of outcome and as a function of population, and I'm gonna to touch on those in a minute. So now, that's the research, that's what I can tell you. Now this is where you guys have to answer your questions. <laughs> 
So how do I then pick which risk assessment tool to use? I think you can answer three questions. First, what is the outcome that you are trying to assess the likelihood of? Second, what is the population you're working with? And then third is what are the actual logistics? These are like the real practical things. Time, space, money, things like that. So in terms of the outcomes of interest, um, some instruments did perform better in assessing the likelihood of specific outcomes. So we looked at new offenses as well as violations, and when we sort of compiled that all together, the research looked best for the salient factor score. That said, a lot of the instruments performed really well overall, but this is the one that sort of emerged at the top in terms of this outcome. In terms of just considering new offenses, excluding violations, um, a few instruments. The Ohio Risk Assessment System of Instruments worked really well. The um, Federal Post-Conviction Risk Assessment also did very well, as did the STRONG, um, the Static Risk and Offender Needs Guide. If we were only interested in violations, then the Wisconsin Risk and Needs Instrument, or its new iteration, the CAIS, which is the fourth generation version of this, um, did very well. The next issue is what is your population? And unfortunately, this actually becomes very difficult to answer in terms of the research base. Some instruments are specifically developed for, those, um, um, for specialized populations. So the salient factor score instruments, for example, are designed specifically for parolees. And so it's not to say you can't apply them to other populations, but if you're going to do that, do it knowing that it was designed for something else and that it's sort of your agency's job to evaluate to make sure it does work for your population. The um, SPIN W was developed specifically for women, so I would never recommend to somebody to apply that to a male offender group. Some instruments also performed better for some subgroups, and I'm going to pick on the LSI for a moment, only because it had the larger research base, and so we could actually do more subgroup analysis with it. But there's a very consistent literature in um, the US research, as well as the Canadian and the um, UK research, that the LSI assessments of female offenders are not very accurate. There's also very limited evidence, not to say that they don't work, we just don't have much evidence behind them regarding predictive validity um, within subgroups. And only a handful of the studies that we looked at actually looked at validity as a function of offender sex or race or ethnicity. Um, and none compared predictive validity as a function of mental illness or specific psychiatric diagnoses. So this third question um, might actually be the question you ask first. So what are the logistics? What information do we have on these folks? Do not implement a risk assessment tool that requires doing interviews with the offender and their collaterals if you're not going to have access to those individuals. So look at what type of information these tools say they need. And this will be spelled out and delineated very clearly on their websites or in their manuals. The time required to complete a risk assessment. The number of items included in these tools ranged anywhere from four in the, um, the screening instrument from the uh, Ohio group to 130 or 140 even in some other instruments. So that's going to take different amounts of time. Also be cognizant of the staff resources, training, and background. Some of these tools require certification um, programs and training programs. So you can't say you're going to implement that tool if you can't also afford to send your staff off to do the certification. Um, some also require specific professional degrees. So some instruments like the LSI need to have somebody who qualifies as a B category level clinician or higher supervising. So don't pick that instrument if you don't have somebody who fulfills that um, qualification. Or hire somebody who does. <laughs> and then the last piece is cost. Some of these instruments are very expensive. <laughs> very, very expensive. And you need to think about the cost in terms of upfront training, in terms of ongoing training, in terms of 
purchasing the forms themselves or if it's an online system of integrating with your electronic records. And so there's just a very real practical issue of getting everybody trained up and then using these tools in an ongoing fashion. A couple additional considerations. These um, are uh, research studies for the most part. And so um, the generalizability to what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis is not actually that obvious. So research assistants filling out these forms are different than professionals filling out these forms. Um, the amount of time is usually much longer. We usually have a lot more um, time and energy to put on filling out these assessments when we're doing research. The resources and the training, like I said, if it's myself training my um, students on how to use the start, well, I wrote the instruments, and I'm going to spend more, or the instrument, I'm going to spend more time with them, and I'm going to give them one on one training that you might not get if you order a start online. This plays into allegiance effects, and that's what's going on um, here. And so we do see systematically better performance in studies conducted by the tool authors. And that's not to say that. Um, you know, we're all out there fudging our results. This is simply to say that maybe you need to look into hiring the individuals as consultants or making sure that your staff do the training programs that are recommended with the instrument. And then what I'm going to wrap up today talking about is that predictive validity does not mean reduced recidivism. And um, this is our fault as much as researchers as it is um, sort of the bigger picture of, well, I implemented a tool and that was the end of that. So here we need to first of all look at implementing the tool with fidelity, and then we also need to look at using the assessments to inform um, management and practice. There's a recent report that some colleagues of mine put out um, on implementation of risk assessment within juvenile justice settings, and I think all of the same principles hold here. So I wanted to touch on some of these issues um, to wrap up the presentation. It's not enough to implement or to say I'm going to use this tool if you don't use it the way it's supposed to be used. Some of the things you need to do, um, preparing and um, getting staff and stakeholder buy-in is critical. The implementation is not going to happen if you don't have this. You have to select and prepare the risk assessment tool. And so this is about picking the tool that suits your needs. What we know in most of the research now is that of these sort of top instruments, any single one of them will improve your practice. It's just about picking one that really fits what you need to do. Um, a few people have talked about the importance of policies, and this is absolutely crucial. If you don't have a policy in place that says, well, now you must do this for all new offenders coming in, well, people aren't going to do it. <laughs> They're still going to get paid. They're still going to go home at the end of the day. There needs to be policies in place that say that this is now part of your job. Training is key. Um, I've gotten several really fabulous consulting jobs because they've tried to implement tools, and then they call me a year later, and they've made a total mess of it, and I have to come and fix it. And so here, if you don't go through the proper training programs, you're not actually filling out the survey or the um, risk assessment tool the way it was designed to be used. Very important to pilot test. I always recommend staged implementation. Start with one unit. Start with a one group or start with one small agency. You don't want to roll, across, um, roll implementation out agency-wide without first working out the kinks. Once you go to full implementation, you need to spend some time on sustainability tasks. One of the most crucial things is that training is not a one-off thing. There needs to be ongoing booster sessions. In the research um, in the mental health services and behavioral health um, services world, suggests that every six months, as a minimum, there needs to be booster training or refresher training. Um, just to make sure there's not drift away from what it is we're doing and that we haven't somehow, with the best intentions, changed our interpretation of what it is when somebody says mental state or impulsivity as this item. Um, some other things for ongoing tasks for sustainability is not just about fidelity, but also about evaluation. So you need to do internal evaluations of whether or not the instrument is working the way it should in your agency. One thing I drive home with my um, psychology students, and if you ever submit a paper that 
um, I review, you'll know it's me because I say this. A tool does not have reliability or validity. The assessments completed using a tool have reliability or validity. So it's not enough to say, well, this was validated in Connecticut, so we're going to use it and it's going to work here. You need to look at whether when your staff use it on your clients or offenders in your setting, that it still has reliability and validity. And so that's a very important take home message. All right, let's say we got all that right. Accurate and reliable assessments do not reduce recidivism on their own. There's not some sort of magical thing that happens in the air that you've filled out a risk assessment, you've put it on the offender's file, and poof, he is less likely to reoffend. That'd be great, but that's not how it works. <laughs> What we have to do is actually go into comprehensive case planning. And this is where we need to think about all of those R&R principles and actually put them into practice for this one offender. So first of all, the level of intervention needs to be commensurate with the offender's level of risk. And um, the point David made earlier today is very well taken. Um, we much rather work with the low risk guys because it's just so much easier. They're easier to work with, they're more pleasurable to be around, but what the research shows is that we're actually turning them into better offenders, which is not exactly what we're doing. <laughs> um, we have to make sure that they address identified areas of risk and need. And so the classic example, again, is anger management. Domestic violence offenders are, in almost every jurisdiction, mandated to anger management well, a lot of individuals who engage in domestic violence have nothing to do, it's not about anger. And what we find is that we put them in these anger management groups, they're angry at us that we put them in these anger, anger management groups, and during the group they go, wait a minute, I can use this to also show my anger? Awesome! So now we're actually giving them more tools and turning them into better users of domestic violence in terms of transmitting their anger. We also have to build on offender strengths, and I really think that identifying protective factors in the individual case is the cornerstone of a good case management plan. What is it that this offender is good at, and how can we translate those skills into some of these other areas? Or what are areas of motivation for this individual? Do they really like sports? Is that something that we can use to develop a good rehabilitation plan? We have to deliver it in a way that is appropriate, and again, much like every other speaker today, I'm sure many of you tuned out about 45 minutes ago, partly because you are not auditory learners. And I apologize, and if there was a way I could come up with tactile risk assessment, I would make a lot of money. <laughs> um, the last piece here is that it's gotta be evaluated and amended over time. Risk assessment is also a process through which we can figure out whether or not we are doing something that's working. So it's not just an evaluation of whether the offender is changing over time, but also an evaluation of our skills and our intervention strategies and whether the programs and tools that we're using are working. The last thing I wanted to leave you with today um, and wrap up is it on this idea of um, communication. And um, I mentioned it at the very beginning of the presentation that I was going to talk about communication. And one thing that we're missing is until the fourth generation of tool, we haven't really talked about communication at all, about getting this information into the hands of other people. Even in the fourth generation tool, they don't typically come with a call log or a communication protocol. And so this is something when we're talking about implementing a risk assessment tool, that at the very front end of the process, in that preparation stage, we need to figure out some very basic things. I've done a risk assessment, now who would I call? <laughs> One thing that I have found to be the most critical key to implementation success is, is there a tab in their file that the risk assessment goes under that we all know that's where the risk assessment forms go? Or if it's on the computer, do we all know that they're in the same place? And so just creating these very basic, almost um, seemingly like trivial kinds of communication plans are very important. On the extreme end, if there is a concern about a critical incident, what is the protocol that I go through? What level of assessment or of risk on the risk assessment triggers that? 
And we don't often do a good job of setting up those protocols until after the fact. And time and time again, where we've seen implementations that have been very successfully implemented, very accurate, very reliable risk assessments, and then nonetheless, there are critical incidents. And what we end up seeing is that those critical incidents were very well documented, very well predicted, and nobody was told about them, and there wasn't that communication. There was a stop gap. The other place that communication is key is during the point of transition. And so going between um, wards or going between units, going between facilities, going between agencies. And so there need to be communication protocols around, OK, well, when this offender is released into the hands of probation, what pieces of this risk assessment go with them? How do we communicate this to the people who are going to deal with him or her next? And that's something that is going to be very agency specific, but that is something we have to turn our head um, and attention to even before we pick what tool it is we're going to use. So I'm going to leave um, sort of the formal part of my presentation with this quote. And again, stealing shamelessly from colleagues of mine, um, but I think this really drives it home. Improper risk communication can render a risk assessment that was otherwise well conducted completely useless and even worse if it gives the consumers the wrong impression. And so this is just, again, emphasizing that we can do everything I talked about during the presentation very well. But if we don't get that into the hands of people who can use the information, it's all for naught. So thank you. And we have time for questions if we want to. Uh, thank you. You had mentioned earlier that you were willing to talk about some ways to improve inter-rater reliability in screening oh. and assessment. Could you just cover some of that briefly, please? Sure. So um, some of the basic um, approaches um, are actually delineated very well in that document I mentioned by um, Vincent and colleagues. But some of the things at the front end, first of all, training. You have to do the training um, that the instrument um, was sort of developed and that the team behind the instruments say that you need to do. And I think that's very key. Um, the second piece there is that once you do, let's say it's a one day or a half day training workshop or an online training, um, one of the other things that um, they recommend and that we do in practice is case study training. And so I will go in and train an agency for a day, but then the expectation is that their staff are going to do somewhere between three to five case studies after the fact. So they've got to be cases for which there is a known answer um, and that we can then provide feedback and get people um, sort of ramped up on uh, making sure that there's inter-rater reliability. And you can also come up with um, some sort of generally sort of accepted guidelines. OK, you need to be answering these in a, you know, about 80% consensus in terms of me saying that this person was high, low, or moderate risk um, versus what you guys say. So that's one thing you have to do at the front end. I think you need to have practice doing these tools before you go and launch out in the real world. The second thing is the uh, refresher training. And during refresher training is where we um, talk about getting rid of drift. They talk about this in a lot of the um, mental health services field or assessment work in terms of when I say the term mental state as an example, are we still using the same definition of that? And so when we do refresher training, typically that also involves doing another case study or two and making sure that everybody is still maintaining some defined level of um, agreement between raters. Those are probably the two sort of most common ways um, from an outside training perspective. The other way is with supervision. So much like you would implement um, a treatment or an intervention approach where there would be a supervisor of that, there needs to be a risk management supervisor. When I do training on the start, I call them my, my master start users. So these are the folks on site who are going to be the on site experts who provide supervision in this assessment approach. And so that there's somebody on site for whom staff can go to and ask questions about ratings and who can also provide supervision on the ratings themselves. Has anyone created a matrix or something like that with the top tools that you said and then the look at the outcome, the population and logistics? and try to say which ones fit <laughs> in a summary fashion? Well, stay tuned for the, uh, the monograph that's coming out in spring. Um, so it'll answer some of those questions. Some of the issues around cost are tricky. 
Um, it depends on you know how many, what volume you're going to purchase, um, what training package you're going to purchase it with, and so we can't really speak to cost um, because it depends a lot on where it's published by whom and what their sort of rules are about that. But we will be having information in the report um, that shows you know the outcomes that they did best at predicting, the outcomes for which there were no um, sort of research studies done on it, um, and some of the logistics in terms of what's included, how long does it take. So that will be, it's forthcoming. You mentioned a, a study um, on risk assessment in a juvenile justice set, setting. Mm -hmm. um, is that on our drive, or uh, what's the name of the study? That is a report um, that was published. It was funded by the um, MacArthur um, Foundation and is available on the University of Massachusetts website. Uh, I'd be happy to give you the reference. The reference, uh, the reference at the bottom was the authors are Vincent, Guy, and Grisso. Um, came out in November, but I'm more than happy to, to share that with others. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Uh, the state that I come from mandates that the LSIR be the evaluative tool u utilized mm -hmm. by probation. Sure. Obviously, your comments about its effectiveness or lack of effectiveness with the uh, women population, the female population, mm -hmm. is a concern. Could you be more specific about what deficiencies have been identified or what tools might supplement? Sure. Um, supplementing is a good question. I don't like that term, in fact, um, because it sort of sounds like an add-on. The it's not going to do you a disservice to use the LSI with women. However, what we've seen is that it doesn't do a good job in terms of straight predictive validity with female offenders. So it's not going to make your assessments work uh, worse, but it's not as accurate for women as it is for men. And so the um, general sort of consensus in the research on the LSIR is that it's better for um, use with men. In terms of other instruments, there are a couple instruments out there um, with varying degrees of research base behind them, partly because we don't have the size of samples of female offenders within which we can do these research studies. But um, so for example, the SPIN W, um, is developed specifically for women. There's not a lot of research, only a couple studies, but the research looks pretty good. Um, but I'm not suggesting that you stop using the LSIR because it's better than not using the LSIR. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to just clarify something you said in the early part, and it could have just, I might have misunderstood, but it sounded like you were making a, distinct, a distinction between certain kind of violence and general offending, and mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak about that, because where in our jurisdiction any form of violence would be considered a reoffense. Oh, absolutely. And so my point is only that there is a distinction when we talk about what is included in this category of general offending. So general offending isn't a huge category, but the behaviors that are violent and the behaviors that, especially around sexual violence, what the predictors are are going to be different. Um, and so there's a need for specificity when you're picking up a tool to say, well, was this designed to predict, quote unquote, general offending, nonviolent offending, sexual offending? So for example, some of the tools, um, I'm going to pick on the LSI again because it's fresh in my mind, but um, it might not include um, important predictors of sexual offending, like paraphilias. And so that's something where it would be, um, you know, just something to be cognizant of when you're using that tool, that it was actually designed for sort of the broad category of, of offending. And that's the distinction that I was making there. All of those things obviously would be considered criminal behavior. Please join me in thanking Dr. Desmarais for her presentation. Thanks.